Okay. Hello, everybody. So uh, today we start uh, discussing how an SMT solver works. Um, can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So the very uh, the very basic idea of uh, SMT solve is so-called uh, the lazy paradigm, also called DPLLT. And uh, it consists in the, the combination of a SAT solver with a specialized field, um, decision procedure for the conjunctive fragment of the given theory. So uh, this is called the, the lazy approach, uh, also known uh, as DPLLT. Okay, there are. So the idea is that a CDCL SAT solver is used to enumerate a truth assignment, that's called a mu i, for the Boolean abstraction of the input formula phi. Well, the, okay, what is uh, the Boolean abstraction, first of all? Boolean abstraction is uh, uh, a formula, uh, given an SMT formula, you, you um, label, you substitute every uh, theory atom, so theory specific atom with uh, one fresh Boolean variable, okay? Of course, syntactically identical uh, theory atoms are uh, uh, written by the same uh, uh, Boolean, uh, Boolean atom, okay? It's an abstraction. Well, you can do that explicitly or implicitly, okay? So the idea is that you see a theory atom as a Boolean atom, okay? So regardless uh, how it's shaped. So you completely ignore his uh, internal meaning, theory meaning, but you see just as an, atom, as an atom whose value can be either true or false, okay? So you can do that directly or explicitly uh, create this Boolean formula, which is the Boolean abstraction of, of the formula, okay? Then, so you find, you find a satisfying truth assignment of this formula, okay? Then, of course, for such truth assignment, in order to be uh, a satisfying assignment, uh, uh, you need this tooth assignment must be coherent with the theory. So every such tooth assignment corresponds to a, conju a set or conjunction of uh, literals in, in the theory. I will show you an example in the next slide. Okay. And uh, you invoke a theory specific solver. So a T solver is for a given theory T, linear arithmetic, bit vector, whatever, is some device who, who is, which is able to detect, which will receive the conjunction of literals from our given theory and says whether it's satisfiable or not, plus provides some other information that we will discuss later. Okay? So, substantially, this is the um combination of two this this dialogue between two entities uh one such solver which deals the boolean component of reasoning so you you notice that in this schema you decouple the boolean component of reasoning from the theory specific component of reasoning okay and you let the the sub solver to handle it and you um you ask instead the theory specific solver to enter the pure theory reason without any Boolean component of reason. Okay, so this is schema, this schema with the proper variations is uh, the, the main uh, uh, schema on which uh, most of, uh, of the current state of the art uh, um, SMT solvers are based upon. Uh, the key point uh, is, uh, and we'll illustrate some, uh, having uh, uh, developing techniques uh, uh, to maximize the benefit of integration, so to uh, optimize the synergy between these two distinct solvers. Let me show you an example. Okay, as I told you at the beginning of this class, uh, uh, I'm uh, always using uh, linear arithmetic as a uh, as underground uh, underlying theory, just because it's, uh, it's semantics is obvious to everybody, so you don't need any logical training to understand it. Okay, just remember your uh, mm, secondary school uh, uh, knowledge. Okay, so suppose you have initially uh, this formula here, 
So you have, uh, let's say, seven clauses. Uh, and this is an LRA, LRA, so linear real arithmetic. And you notice that you have a combination of, uh, of all the clauses here are intended to be a conjunction of such clauses. Okay. And uh, here you have uh, some atoms, uh, uh, some Boolean atoms, A1, A2, uh, possibly negated ones. Okay. And you have some uh, uh, arithmetical, um, arithmetical atoms, like which are substantial equalities and inequalities in linear real arithmetic. Okay. On under some variables, B1, B2, B5, and whatever. Okay. So, and you want to find whether this formula is uh, satisfiable. So if there exists uh, a truth assignment to the Boolean atoms and uh, uh, arithmetic value assignment to the variable one or two such that overall this formula is satisfied. Okay, so what you do here is you, the first thing you build is either explicit or implicit, but typically we, you do that explicitly. You build the Boolean abstraction on the form. Boolean abstraction is a formula in which Boolean atoms are, remain the same, of course, and uh, so that is Boolean at uh, atoms are, uh, are abstract into themselves, and uh, every arithmetic atom is substituted with one fresh Boolean variables. I use uh, A as original variables and the Bs as uh, fresh labeling uh, variables. Of course, with the intended meaning that, of course, the same, um, uh, the same atom is labeled by uh, syntactically identical atoms are labeled by the same Boolean atoms. Boolean atom, for instance, uh, here, you have a three V1 minus two V2 is more or equal than three, and, the, and the, you have it again here, okay? And you see that they are labeled by the same Boolean atom. Okay, I hope the notion of Boolean abstraction is clear for everybody, right? It's quite simple and intuitive, I would say. Okay, now let's feed, you have to feed this formula to a such solver. Well, typically those formulas are satisfiable, right? Because if this, uh, if the formula is, the Boolean abstraction is unsatisfiable, well, first of all, you understand, of course, that the um, uh, the Boolean abstraction is an uh, an over approximation of of the original formula, in the sense that uh, if the formula is in if the abstract formula is unsatisfiable, obviously also the original one is unsatisfiable, but not vice versa, because uh, a satisfying a model for this may not correspond a satisfying model of this. So let's run a sub solver over this formula, okay? And for instance, uh, this sub solver finds a truth satisfying assignment, which is marked here in a, uh, with the, uh, this uh, uh, in, in blue here. Well, it's easy to see that all those literals satisfy the formula because uh, you see that you have at least one blue literal for every clause, okay? And so suppose these are decisions and these are uh, propagations, okay? Uh, I will explain later what this T means, okay? So we have this truth assignment, however, however this has been obtained, okay? Great, so this is, uh, oh, I used the, the P uh, the, um, uh, here, uh, and mu P and uh, phi P to denote the Boolean abstraction, so P is proposition. Boolean abstraction is also called the proposition abstraction, okay? So this, uh, the, so I denote with uh, the, this apex P here uh, to denote whether I'm moving in the Boolean space, wherever the, the original symbols move uh, in the uh, SMT space, okay? Now, if I, uh, I have this truth assignment, okay? And uh, this is collected by this set of literals here, okay? Notice that we have some original literals for is the A1 and A2 here. And we have some literals on the newly introduced, newly introduced literals. So what happens? I map back this literal into the space of LRA. Okay. So for instance, not V5 correspond to not V1 minus V3 
is more equal than uh, uh, where is b5 here not the one minus b3 is more equal than b6 um, b8 corresponds to uh, v3 equals 3 v5 plus 4 and so on and so forth right of course if there's mac back uh, which I passed with three solver, I don't need mapping the Boolean atoms. I don't need the map putting the A's here, right? Because they have no role in, uh, in arithmetic. Well, of course, uh, the Boolean ones will be satisfiable, okay? Because they already are a truth assignment from here. So you don't have A or not A here, right? And uh, they have no role in arithmetic, okay? So so you can drop you you drop them from the list of arithmetical literals so you pass these arithmetical literals to a, a theory solver able to handle linear arithmetic okay notice that the theory solver will uh, handle negation by just uh, rewriting uh, the uh, the atom so for instance not one not one minus three is more or equal than six will be rewritten as a, a 3v1 minus v3 strictly greater than 6. Notice that in linear arithmetic you also have uh, uh, opposite uh, uh, op um, operators. So small or equal, the opposite of small or equal is strictly greater than, uh, the opposite of strictly smaller is uh, greater or equal, and so on and so forth. Okay? So we can handle this, for instance, by, as you see by the simplex algorithm. And the simplest algorithm tells us, for instance, in this case, that this is not satisfiable. Okay. So, in fact, if uh, if you see these three atoms here that I have uh, uh, listed here, they are inconsistent. Why? Well, you see this because uh, uh, you. Um, uh, you can substitute v3 here. So this says that 3v1 uh, uh, minus v3 is strictly greater than 6, right? Okay. Here allows you to rewrite, you can rewrite v3 with 3v5 uh, plus 4. Okay. So this means that 3v1 uh, 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 minus 3v5. Uh, 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 minus four, so is is uh, strictly greater than ten, but, and this is says that this is smaller than one. Okay, so if you combine these two atoms, you say that uh, uh, three v one uh, minus uh, three v three uh, three v five uh, is uh, uh, strictly greater than ten. So this means that v one minus v five. Uh, is uh, strictly greater than 10 thirds, which is about uh, 3 dot something, right? 3 dot 3, blah, 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 blah. So this says that the, this different is uh, strictly greater than uh, 3 dot 3 something. And this says that the same difference is as more equal than one. Okay. So this is, of course, incompatible. Okay. So the idea is so the theory solver returns. Unsat. So in the simplest possible form, the, the theory solver returns unsat, okay? Which means that uh, the, the SAT solver in some way has to find a new assignment, okay? If the theory solver returned SAT, then we would have done. We could stop and conclude that the formula is satisfiable. Why? Because you have a set of literals which is consistent and whose truth value, so if assign, so you have a set of the values of uh, X uh, on the variables, which make these literals true, and which means that they also make all the formula true. Okay? So this is very high level, how an the, the very basic principle uh, on top of which uh, um, an SMT solver works. So let's see something more in detail. So is it clear so far? So we have decoupling the, the components. 
the purely Boolean logic, the purely Boolean component, which is handled by a sub solver, and the purely theory specific, which has no Boolean component to reason because it just reason on the conjunctions of literals, so no no Boolean op sets of literals, no Boolean operators. Okay, uh, the negations so you can think of the negation as already imported inside the atom. Okay, so one the sub solver is good in doing Boolean reason, but knows nothing about the theory. The theory solver knows everything about the theory, but is, is incapable to do any Boolean reason, okay? They discuss to each other, okay? Is, a, is an interaction between these two, is a continuous interaction between these two guys, okay? Okay, let me go through, okay, this is the very, very basic idea. Okay, but there is much better than this. Okay, well, the key point uh, about a SMT solver is the way that they are they interact with the CDCL framework. Okay, remember the, the idea of CDCL. CDCL uh, in CDCL you have um, that every time a tooth assignment, uh, so you that every time a, a tooth assignment falsifies some clause, makes some uh, clause of false then uh, you find uh, the you run a conflict analysis and try to figure out the subset of the tooth assignment which actually caused by unipropagation this the the, um, the falsification of the clause and uh, you you learn it so you you learn uh, uh, the negation of a such tooth assignment as a clause either temporary or uh, or permanently and you use this clause to jump back to back jump typically to the highest point where you would have done something different if only you had known that clause in advance okay well in smt we use the very same principle the difference is that we use as conflict set what what in sat is a conflict set for us is the conflict set is uh, instead the subset of literals which cause the failure in the theory okay so that is the following uh, we assume that uh, the theory solver not only is able to conclude whether a truth assignment is satis sorry a set of literals is uh, satisfied or not in the theory but also we assume that it's also capable of telling what are the subset of literals which cause the inconsistency. If, if the assignment is inconsistent, is able to find the subset of literals which cause the inconsistency. In the previous case, the, the theory solver not only says, look, this set is inconsistent in linear arithmetic, but it also says, look, it's, it's inconsistent due to these three literals here okay this is called the conflict set okay so suppose the three solve is able to return a concept possibly minimal one uh, just one remark uh, remember the difference in the mathematics between the, dif the notion of a minimality and the, the difference between a minimal set and the minimum Minimal means that no strict subset is still a conflict set. Minimum means shortest. Okay, remember the difference. If minimum is also minimal but not vice versa. So a minimal subset is minimal, but there could be a completely different one which is shorter. Okay, if it's the shortest, it's also minimal, of course. Okay, just to do a clarification because we use the notion of minimality and uh, I don't want anybody to, to make a confusion with the notion of, of a minimum. Okay, now, okay, so suppose that you are able to extract a conflict set, a possible minimal one, possible. It's not always the case that you are able to find a minimal one, but assuming that you are able to, okay. Then what you do is you learn, uh, use, um, you learn its negation as a conflict clause. So you pretend 
that your uh, the negation of this uh, of this um, conflict set is is a, a conflict clause, and they use it to drive the back jumping and learning mechanism of the SAT solver, as if it were a conflict in, uh, a conflict clause in SAT. One first important remark I want to say is that not ETA. So ETA is inconsistent in the theory, okay? This means that its negation is valid in the theory, okay? So all models in the theory satisfies the negation of, or satisfies C, okay? So adding a clause, conjoining a clause, such clause to the formula does not change the semantics of the formula, okay? You can always add a valid formula, conjoin a formula to a, okay? If you take a formula and conjoin a valid formula to it, the conjunction is, is logically equivalent to the original formula, okay? Because all its models are satisfied, okay? All the models of, a, of the formula satisfy the model of the art and vice versa. Is this clear, guys? If you have some formula and you conjoin it with the valid formula, the result is, uh, is logically equivalent to the, to the formal formula, okay? So adding a valid formula does not change the logic. Okay, because all the models of the former are already model, are still models of the latter. Okay, guys, is this last step obvious to everybody? Because this is important. This is the very basic. This is what justifies learning. Okay, you you can safely add a, a conflict clause because the clause is part is valid here okay okay guys yes cool. yep. yeah okay sorry my sorry if it was obvious for most of you but i want i want to be sure that this is obvious okay okay so you can conjoin and you can use it for as as a conflict clause for back jumping and learning Notice that, of course, that the less redundant is eta, the more search is saved, of course, right? Because, so it's very important if uh, the eta return is minimal or not far from being minimal, because the shortest the close, the more informative it is, and the, the more branching allows to cut. Okay? So let me see again an example with that. Suppose we are in the very same position that we were before, right? So we had this formula, we had this truth assignment, uh, blah, 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 blah. Again, I don't tell you what this T is so far. Okay, so we have uh, asked uh, the, our theory solver whether this uh, set of literals is uh, uh, consistent in arithmetic. And the set solver uh, says, no, this is not. Okay. And uh, this returns a, a conflict set, it returns a subset eta, okay, which is exactly the, the subset we, that we have seen in the previous slide, okay. Okay, this conflict set is, is inconsistent, okay, so this corresponds to a, an abstract uh, conflict set, B, B5, B8, B2. So we negate it into the clause B5 or B, not B8 or not B2, and we safely add it to the formula. Okay, notice that this, uh, we can uh, safely add this uh, clause to the, uh, to the formula, okay? But this clause drives a back jumping Big jumping up to some level here, right? So you see, since you have B5 or not B8 or not B2, you jump to the highest place 
Well, you would have done anything different if only you had known this clause. In this case, B5, B8, and unipropagate not B2. Notice that you skip one step here, because with the standard chronological backtracking, you would have undo, uh, undo not B1. But here, the clause says, look, as soon as B5 and B8 are assigned, then you have to uh, unipropagate not B2. Okay, but then if you unipropagate not B2, where is it? Uh, not B2 here. Uh, okay, then here you have to unipropagate also not, not A2 on this clause. This chain causes a new chain of unipropagations. But unipropagate not A2, you also here unipropagate B3. And then the search proceeds. Okay. Sorry, I have a question here. Sorry? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, sure. What you just highlighted, what is the difference between the green part and the blue part? Why is not before green? No, uh, okay. Uh, this is okay. Here, the green, everything is green unless there's anything different, okay? Uh, and no, no, in the in the upper part, in the upper part. Yeah. No, no, in the middle. Not before is green. No, before is is not assigned. Before is not assigned. Okay. Okay. Blue is a literal which is made true in this branch. Okay. And gray is something which is made false. Okay. Perfect. I, I use gray to emphasize the fact that he has been deleted from the formula, okay? You okay, perfect. pretend he's no more there until you back jump, back track, of course. So in this branch, here, uh, not to be one, uh, A2. So you see not A2 is made false beca because of, of this A2. Okay, so you okay, see okay. green is uh, simply unassigned. Uh, the, uh, okay, this is a snapshot of, uh, haha. This is just an intermediate step of an uh, animated slide, uh, one piece of an, a previous animated slide that I did in, uh, in, another, in another presentation. And originally everything was green here. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so uh, as long as assigned things, well, the literal which are made true are written in blue and the literal which are made uh, false are uh, uh, written in pale gray. Pay gray means, uh, well, they are no more there, but I, instead of why, so you still want to see that they, they used to be there, right? Okay. Is it clear? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so green is, simply means here, not assigned yet, but notice that you cannot, you don't need assigned before here because this clause is already satisfied by not be five. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. So notice that you, in doing that, you skip, for instance, one, one decision. Okay, you can also pretend that this is just a, a, a tiny piece of a much bigger formula. Okay, and in between those decisions, you have a lot of uh, other assignment uh, related to other parts of the formula, okay? So in doing that, you, you jump and skip potentially many, many decisions, decision levels, right? Okay? Yes. Notice that now, from now on, this is, uh, the new clause is a lemma, okay? Is a lemma in the sense that it's valid. It's always true in mathematics that uh, uh, 3 v 1 minus v 3 is more or equal to 6, uh, or uh, v 3 is different from 3 v 5 plus 4, or not v 1 minus v 5 is more or equal than 1. Okay? So the negation of these three guys is valid. Is always true. Well, substantially, because one of the two literals can be entailed by the others, right? So, uh, for instance, 3v1 uh, minus 
v5 uh, is more equal than a six uh, um, and uh, uh, where, where is it sorry the uh, this is the negation and the uh, three different from this implies that this is uh, false okay so these are the negation of these is a valid formula Okay, is always fine. Okay, you mean that you can entail so from from this and this you can entail the negation of this. Okay, just substitute the three with the three with five plus four. This says that the three, the two conjunction, the conjunction of these two guys here, say that uh, three to one. Uh, minus 3 to 5 is uh, strictly greater than 10, which means that v1 my, these two guys here say v1 minus v5 is strictly greater than 10 over 10 thirds, okay, which entail this fa the fact that this is false. So these two guys here entail that this atom is false, or entail not v1 minus v5 is more equal than 1. Are we there? So this is valid. Yes. So the negation of this is valid. So you can safely add here because you are adding a, a valid formula. All right? Cool. Okay, but you can do better. Yeah, you can do something, even something more. Because here, the clause that you have inferred is something valid. Okay? Something that uh, is always the case. But you can do better. So you can also infer some clause, some, some clause such that it's entailed by the formula. It's not bad, but it's entailed by the formula. How? Use C8 and apply conf CDCL conflict analysis to this. Okay. Use C8. Okay, as a theory, so pretend that your C8, so your the negation of your conflict set, is a failed, is a failed um, closure, is a closure which has been falsified. So pretend that you have added the conflict clause from the beginning. Okay, so this is valid. Okay, so pretend that you had added the conflict clause was there from the beginning. Okay, if so, when you would have failed, your truth assignment would have made this clause false, right? Well, eta is, is the negation of this clause, right? So we would have falsified that. So if so, the, the, the sub solver would have done conflict analysis over that and would have entailed another clause which is B5 or not B8 or B1. Okay, just uh, apply the standard conflict analysis resolution steps, okay, that we have seen uh, last week. Right? So if we saw another clause is entailed. Okay, and this clause is a mixed clause, it's not valid, but is entailed by the original formula by a combination of theory and Boolean. Because it can be entailed by uh, logical, purely Boolean reasoning from the original formula plus a valid formula. Okay, because notice that all those clauses here are original ones. Okay, except this clause here, which is valid. So this clause can be entailed from the original came from the original formula plus some theory information. In particular, this the fact that this clause is valid in uh, in uh, uh, in the theory. So this is a mixed Boolean and uh, theory reasoning, which leads you to learn this other clause here. Okay, so you can add this which is different from uh, C8. Okay, so you can learn also this clause here, and this clause causes you other 
unit propagations. So if this is B5 and not B8 or A1 this time. Remember that before was not B2. Here you have A1. Okay, so it's more informal. Of course, the two ones can be combined together, so you can learn both. You can learn this one because it's valid, it's a valid lemma, and this one because of the conflict clause. So you can learn both. And if so, you can uh, unipropagate lots of stuff, right? Because with the B1 here, uh, I forgot, with B1 here, uh, where is it? B1 here, you can also, you can unipropagate A1. Okay, remember that with not B2, you can unipropagate not A2 and B3. So with the two, you can uh, unipropagate all them. And then after that, you can further unipropagate also B3 because uh, of uh, something, I don't, okay. This uh, you know, B3 here is, why do you of course not propagate B3? I don't remember anymore. Why? Ah, uh, no, A1 here. Uh, I don't remember anymore why you, you probably, well, maybe this is a typo here. Maybe this B3 here is a typo for something else. Uh, what? So B, where is B3? B3, you have A1. Yeah. Ah, yes, because you unipropagate not A2 here. And so you also you can also unipropagate B3 here, okay? Can I ask a question? Sure, absolutely. Uh, in this case, uh, when we do the conflict analysis, yes, I see that uh, in, this, uh, in this case, we have not to add the, the negation of the result but right what while in the while in the stand in the standard cdcl we have to add in the in the set of clauses the the negation of, of the result of the analysis in no, this time no, 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 no. Wait, wait a moment don't don't be misled you have to distinguish between the clause no you had to always add the clause yeah but in in the standard CDCL, we have to add the negation of the result, right? No, or maybe I'm no. confused. No, 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 no. Okay. In, uh, in in standard CDCL, what you have, we have a truth assignment, which is falsifies some clause, makes uh, forget forget the theory part, stay in the pure boolean. Okay. In uh, in CDCL. We have uh, uh, we have a truth assignment which falsifies some clause, okay. And then you build uh, a new clause from uh, conflict analysis. This is resolving against the, the antecedents of the unit propagated literals, okay. Until you you get a more interesting clause. In standard CDCL this clause here is already there right so you don't add it okay yeah, yeah. here in a in a smt what you do is you have found out that this clause here is a lemma is a valid clause okay is a valid in the theory so you could have added it you could have added it uh, a priori, okay? Because it's a lemma, it's something which is intrinsically true in the theory, okay? It's intrinsically true that uh, this uh, liter and this liter entails this liter, the negation of this liter, okay? Notice that this clause, uh, if you are, see a disjunction as, you can always see a, a disjunction as the conjunction of the first Okay, oh, the, the conjunction of the negator of the first implies the, uh, the, the last one, okay? A or B or C can always be seen as not A 
and not B implies C. Okay, okay. so this is valid. Okay, do we agree that this is valid? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say, oh, look, pretend that you had known that clause from the beginning. Okay, when doing conflict analysis here, you pretend you had known this clause from the beginning. So you do two different things. You add that clause explicitly. This alone scores you some big jumping and unit propagation. But also, you pretend you have, you have a truth assignment who has failed exactly on that clause. Okay. Okay. Right? So if you had failed exactly on this clause, you apply conflict analysis, dun, 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 the user conflict analysis, and then it tells you another clause, which is a combination of theory, reasoning, and uh, Boolean reasoning. Actually, is this, a this is a deduction from original clauses plus a lemma. The theory lemma, okay? A valid clause. Are we there, Roberto? Yes, yes, yes. That okay. is uh, actually clear. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah, it was all already clear. Uh, my question uh, was that uh, I remember that in uh, standard CDCL, uh, we we reach at that point in, in where we have to switch uh, the, um, the the atom the the, the clause. No, no, no. Okay, remember that in the in the standard CCL, the clause that you learn here. Okay, I mean you what you uh, okay the 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 learn clause is the negation of a conflict set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So also, so for suppose this was our original formula, and you are plainly re, uh, reasoning on a boolean uh, on the boolean field, right? In the boolean space, you you deduce this clause. This clause here is the negation of a conflict set. Exactly. Okay. A negation of a conflict set. In fact, uh, if you take this formula. And assign uh, B5 to false, B8 to true, and B1 to true, and B1 uh, to false, so the negation of this, by unit propagation, you'll have something which violates this. Okay, yes. Yes, because uh, with B1, then, uh, so if you find B5, uh, B8, and not B5, uh, well, I have to find it out, but. We find uh, B uh, not B five, uh, not B eight, not B five. Where is it? Here, uh, not uh, B eight. Where is it? Not B eight. Here, uh, then you have uh, uh, not B five. Not B eight. So you have, uh, okay, not B5, not B8, and then uh, you have, uh, uh, where is it, uh, B5, not, where is B2 here? Um, oh, yes, with not B2 here, this causes the unit propagation of, uh, uh, with not, not B1, okay, with the, not B1 here, uh, let me check, where is it? Uh, not B1. Uh, uh -huh, but I'm not able to, oh, here we are, we, here we, there's a not B1. Uh, no. Well, okay, so uh, let me go through this. Uh, if we, let me get this formula here, okay. With, if I sign not B1, uh, B8, not B5, not B1, 
B H not this. I cannot find it, but uh, okay, I, I will uh, look at that in the interval. Okay. Okay. So th this is a conflict analysis performed on this uh, uh, on this clause here, and this corresponds uh, as a, a conflict set. Okay. Are we there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. However, so this is a mixture of Boolean and uh, uh, theory reasoning, okay? Okay, so you do apply conflict analysis and uh, you, uh, you have uh, this, this clause here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go ahead. Uh, okay, so Let's do the following. Let's have an interval. So I, I, I may look to the to a better answer to this uh, to this que you, the question you raised, and then we go ahead. Okay. 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 So see you in a few minutes. Um, are we, is everybody there? Hello, guys. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay, Alberto, I have a very quick question, uh, reply. I just um, I forgot. I realized that I forgot to say something. You're explaining. When we do that, um, I mentioned that uh, I will explain this T later. Okay, so if you look at this path, uh, this not to be three doesn't come for unipropagation. Okay, it comes from something else that we'll see in a few slides from now. Okay, and also this clause here comes out of the blue. Okay, mm -hmm. so for now, pretend that you also have on board this clause here, which by the way is another valid clause, okay? And this is, uh, I, I will explain you what this, uh, this comes from this T here, okay? Wait, wait a few seconds. So pretend that you also have this clause on board here, okay? So when you do conflict analysis, okay, you also, at the end of the day, you also infer you also apply this deduction here and uh, in order to have uh, this, this clause here, okay? So this conflict, uh, 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 if you assign not B5, uh, B8, B1, okay? By a sequence of unipropagations, including also an implicit unipropagation of this clause here, you have uh, that the uh, formula uh, violate the, the truth assignment uh, violates this. Okay, so suppose you have uh, not B5 and uh, not B5 and not B1 and not B3, sorry, not B5, not B1 and not uh, blah, 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 not B5, B1. B8 and B2. Oh, sorry, sorry again. Ah, okay. Not B5. B8, not B1. Okay. So with B1, you unipropagate A1. Notice that with B5 and not, um, with not B5 and not B1, here, you also propagate not B3 here, okay? But with this unipropagation here, you unipropagate A1, you unipropagate A2 here or not B3, and this is the key point. This was the, the missing step, okay, before. And, and hence, uh, uh, by unit propagate A2, you also uh, unit, uh, 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 okay, 
by uni propagate A2, you also uni propagate B2 here, yeah. which violates this clause here. Yeah. Okay. So there was a missing step, which was the uni propagation of this clause here, which is a magic clause uh, uh, which we are going to explain, uh, which is implicitly learned that we are going to explain a few slides from now. Okay, sorry if I um, didn't remark this. Okay, I forgot to say that. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I saw also the old slides, and I see, and I saw that uh, the negation was something implicitly not uh, that we have to do. So I was a bit confused. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, okay. Sorry, no, but I I just forgot to say this. Sorry, as a as a preamble of this of this explanation of this guy. So here again, we have a combination. Back jumping here is a mixture. So you learn both of the what is called the theory lemma. So the negation of the the the, um, the conflict set, and this is a lemma in the sense that it is valid, but also clauses which are entailed from the theory lemmas. Okay, like this one. Uh, for instance, in in, uh, in Matsat, which is our SMT solver, we learn a theory lemma permanently. Okay, so the lemmas are, are added permanently, so we never drop. Whereas these kind of clauses here, so the mixed clause, uh, are uh, learned temporarily. So they can be dropped uh, by, uh, by the mechanism of the SAT solver. Remember? Remember that the SAT solver can discharge learn learn uh, clauses, right? So we force, uh, in Massad, we force this to be learned permanently because it's a lemma, it's uh, an important information we get from the theory. Okay. And this is something that you get from the sub solver and so this learn temporarily. The same, so it can be discharged by the sub solver if uh, uh, the sub solver thinks this is the case. Okay. Okay. So is this uh, global picture here? Apart from this, this so suppose uh, this is this. So you can think of this step as you realize that this. Uh, uh, this, this step here, temporary think as you realize that this is a lemma and you propagate it on top of this. Notice that if you have this clause, they, they come as a unit propagation because B5 is true here and B1 is false. Okay. Okay, guys. So pretend it's just uh, you realize that this lemma and you propagate on top of it. Okay, then I will explain later what this is. Okay, so if so, you notice that this is the standard conflict analysis. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes. Okay, so the next important factor is what is called early pruning. So we were saying, uh, right, that uh, uh, so in the general schema that we mentioned here, uh, we wait uh, uh, in order to uh, we wait until the form the tooth assignment satisfies the formula that is all tooth assignment all uh, clauses are satisfied or and then only then we invoke the theory solver. Okay. Actually, this is not what typically happens in the SMT solver. The in the SMT solvers typically the uh, the theory solver is invoked much earlier then uh, um, you don't wait until uh, the, your uh, tooth assignment satisfies the formula in order to check that the tooth assignment is consistent. Okay, so the idea you, is uh, you check the consistency of tooth assignment also of intermediate tooth assignment when you are building them. So you add a few new, new literals, you call the theory solver saying whether the few literals are uh, um, are still the adding the few liters they are still consistent. Okay, what is the reason of that? The reason that if a partial when you are building the SAT solver is building the assignment and you have a partial assignment which does not yet satisfy the formula, but if this is inconsistent in the theory, this means that no none of its extension can be can be consistent. Okay, so all the all their extension can be are inconsistent. 
So you can cut the branch there, saving a lot, a lot, a lot of search, right? So if you have a partial assignment, okay? So you have uh, add a few liters, you invoke SAT, okay, satisfiable, go ahead. Satisfied in the theory, yes, go ahead. This is SAT, yes, you can go ahead. This is SAT, again, go ahead. You can get here, this, you invoke the field service and unsat. Aha, uh -huh. stop here. Tell the SAT solver to stop. Why? Because it's completely useless, it progresses here, right? There's no reason to progress here because they are also this part of the truth assignment is inconsistent in the theory. So it's, you should not add new literals, okay? So the typically, this typically saves a huge amount of, of search with some drawbacks because you may have some uh, useless calls to the theory solver. So this call to the theory solver, this call to the theory solver, this call to the theory solver has produced the no, no information. Actually, we see this is not true, but uh, uh, so this is the possible drawback. So typically you may say cut a lot of search. You have to pay a price for that. So you have intermediate calls to the solver. Well, however, you notice that in general, you know that the, if you're able to cut the tree much earlier, the typical, the number of leaves of a smaller is typically smaller than the number of global leaves, right? So since you would have to call the, the theory solver anyway on the leaves here, typically the number of leaves of the reducer solver is typically much smaller than the one. So it's sufficient that you are able to, to, able to cut one layer, layer of, uh, of, uh, of um, search that uh, um, to, to have this uh, uh, technique uh, work, okay? So if you think, uh, so remember that in a binary tree, the number of leaves uh, is one bigger than the, the total sum of the uh, number of nodes, okay? So in general, if you are able to save uh, the equivalent of one layer of the of, uh, of search, it would uh, be worth uh, doing uh, the intermediate checks. Well, do you see by uh, at naked eye that the number of uh, red dots here is much smaller than the number of leaves here or, or, the, or the black leaves here, right? Okay, so the intuition is uh, don't wait the tooth assignment to be complete. To, uh, call the, the theory solver earlier. That's the idea of early pruning, right? So what is the point here? So, well, also you may have different strategies to apply early pruning, okay? Well, there are some tools which invoke the theory solver every time you add a new theory atom. So this is called eager pruning. It's very aggressive for early pruning. So no matter what, uh, you invoke the theory solver every time a new atom is added to the assignment, including those added by unit propagation. So add a new literal, invoke the theory solver. Add a new literal, invoke the theory solver. Add a new literal, invoke the theory solver. Even, uh, the strategy we adopt in MATSAT uh, is that we invoke a theory solvers only after unipropagation. So at first we let have uh, the unipropagation of such solver run. And then when all the liters uh, uh, applied by unipropagation, then you can invoke the theory solver. So we invoke the theory solvers only before decisions. Before, because uh, uh, unipropagation are cheap, okay? And are deterministic. So it's not worth to save a unit propagations, okay? Instead, decisions are expensive, okay? Expensive because they enlarge the search space. So decisions are a non-deterministic step, which potentially can enlarge the, um, 
which can potentially enlarge the uh, the search tree. Okay. So we, what we typically we, typ we typically invoke uh, early pruning calls only before decisions, and not only then, and not always there. Okay. Another uh, another form of techniques uh, heuristic is that you can uh, uh, do early pruning selectively. So we don't call the theory solver if uh, you since the last call you have added only literals which have no chance of uh, cause any any theory conflict anymore so for instance if you have added only boolean atoms since the since the last call it's useless to invoke the theory solver again right because you have added no new theory literal also if uh, uh, you have other these equalities. So these negative equalities are typically uh, very under very low constraining, right? They're not much constraint. So saying that a value is different from another value is not very constraining. Okay. Or also if you introduce new variables. So if uh, you add a new theory atom which introduces new variables which was not constrained did not occur in any theory literal before well that was not very interesting right so it does have very low chance to further improve so we don't use this well in maths that we have uh, um, incremental heuristics so it just analyzes the success of uh, early pruning and depending on the story of success of early pruning it weakens or hardens the the chance of uh, of uh, uh, in, in calling uh, early pruning so it collects uh, the statistics of the success of early pruning and if the success is high it tends to always apply early pruning in the next steps if the su success is low it tends to uh, um, apply uh, uh, early pruning less frequently. Okay. The last one is probably the most important issue is a uh, weak early pruning. So we should distinguish um, theory solving on uh, uh, intermediate assignments and the theory solving uh, into complete assignments. Uh, because the theory solving into in intermediate assignment has only the scope of um, only the role of uh, trying to prune a search okay but it has no role in correctness whereas uh, the theory solving call with the complete assignment has a role in correctness of the, of the algorithms so what we do in, so sometimes uh, we can introduce a weakened form of early pruning call. So sometimes there are weaker but faster version of the theory solvers, which are not always able to reveal um, the inconsistency. Okay, but but very frequently they are, and they are much cheaper. One typical example that we perform is with linear arithmetic on the integers. Um, linear arithmetic on, on the integers is much, much harder than linear arithmetic on the reals, on the rationals. Okay, so the the conjunctive fragment uh, t -solve, theory solving on the re, on the linear arithmetic on the rationals is a polynomial, whereas uh, theory solving on uh, uh, array on linear arithmetic on the integers is np complete okay so what we do in intermediate calls is uh, we invoke the theory solvers only on the relaxation of the on the formula so if it reveals uh, inconsistency so of course if a, a set of literals is inconsistent in the reals it's obviously also inconsistent in the, in the integers but not vice versa okay so it may be the case that some uh, to, uh, partial of assignment is inconsistent, but it does not re is not revealed. But this intermediate check is much, much, much faster. Okay, and so you don't waste time. And, TP and also it has a, a stronger pruning, pi a pruning power anyway, right? So for instance, for an intermediate check, uh, uh, 
you uh, you may invoke uh, something on uh, the reals rather than on uh, on uh, the integers. Okay. Okay. Let me make one example of early pruning here. So suppose uh, here you have uh, uh, this uh, truth assignment here. You have this formula, and uh, you have assigned only part of those literals okay so notice that this uh, tooth assignment here does not satisfy the the formula okay because there are still two clauses which are not um, made the true are not satisfied yet okay however you may invoke the 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 early pruning calls uh, uh, before taking any further decision you invoke it on this partial assignment and this return of sunset okay due to these three literals here so you don't need going ahead anymore okay so you can prune and uh, and backtrack right you can learn the these uh, three literals and uh, backtrack and this saves the exploration of all possible extensions of this partial assignment okay like in this schema here right this is very very important one together with the back jumping and learning is one of the key steps of um, of early pruning okay is this example clear okay cool okay there are a few things related with uh, uh, early pruning which is the incrementality of the theory solver is very very important when you build and one of the key feature of the theory solver is that it's incrementality so we have already seen one important feature of the theory solver which is that of uh, being able to detect uh, the sub the conflict set causing the inconsistency another very very important feature is its uh, incrementality and backtrackability so the typical uh, behavior of uh, um, a theory solver so the typical way where uh, as a theory solver is invoked in uh, uh, in smt is the following so where is it you invoke it on a, a partial assignment and this returns sat you invoke in uh, you add a few literals and in, and invoke sat you add far more literals and invoke sat you uh, go on go on go on invoke sat until you get on sat and then you pop something Okay, so for instance, you undo mu4, mu3, mu2 due to back, back jumping. And then you add, so still go ahead, add mu2 prime, add mu2 prime, sat, sat, sat. So substantially, you pop and push, pop and push, pop and push. Okay. So it's very important that the theory solver is not a function, but as a similar to incremental sub solving, it's very important that this is this uh, um, the theory solver are incremental incremental but trackable so they have a so you are they are able to reuse the computation of mu1 when invoked the mu1 plus on something else and this is called incrementality okay so when you you have already seen that mu1 is sat okay and uh, you uh, you add mu2 you don't want the theory solver to restart from scratch but it wants to reuse part of the previous computation whatever this means and this would mean something completely different depending on the theory okay so you want uh, substantially incremental versions of the algorithms there okay another important fact is backtrackability so when uh, you decide on sat and then you pop something and for instance you get back to mu1 here and then you start the mu2 you want to efficient efficiently undo all the step and then restore the status of the search at that stage so that you can re-exploit incrementality in the future so this is means that in general the algorithm for theory solving are very specific 
So an algorithm that in general works well for conjunctional theory literals, like for instance, the simplex for a conjunction of inequalities in the linear arithmetic is not necessarily good for the resolver. You have to adapt it in order to be able, first, to detect conflict sets, second, to be incremental backtrackable, okay? And we, we see that some algorithms are incremental and backtrackable, okay? Uh, so the three solver overall requires a stack-based interface. This is very similar to the notion of incrementality in SAT, right? So you need popping and pushing. So it's not a standalone function, but it's a stack-based, a stack-based interface. You pop and push, pop and push, pop and push something. Okay? Push and pop. Okay, and here it comes with the famous T. Uh, another feature which is very, very important, particularly in uh, simple theories like uh, difference logic, UF and, uh, and others, is the capability of performing theory deductions. Okay. So, suppose you have a partial assignment. So, if you are uh, during an early pruning call, you invoke uh, uh, the theory solver with a partial assignment. Let's call it you. And the theory solvers knows a priori the list of unassigned atoms, theory atoms. Okay, so from the beginning you give the theory, the, uh, the theory literal the set of all the uh, can not only all the not only he knows the, the truth assignment, but he knows all the candidate theory atoms. So it may be the case very often, it may be the case that uh, uh, your algorithm is able not only to say look at this partial assignment is satisfiable. But also to say, look, not only this is satisfiable, but you can also deduce that the, from this truth assignment that this literal is true, or this, this atom is true, or this atom is false as a consequence of, of uh, your solver. Okay? So, so, so when a partial assignment the mu is theory satisfiable, Maybe the case that the solver is able to return also an assignment to some unassigned atom, which is entailed in the theory by mu. Okay, so look, you say, okay, look, not only the, the set of literals that you have passed me is consistent, but look, you also have passed me this list of atom. Look, there is this atom here, which is entailed to be false by the remaining the remaining uh, um, by the, the current of assignment as a consequence in the theory of the current of assignment. So if the theory solver has deduction capabilities, then if you can do that, if, if this is the case, you can do two important things here. You unit propagate. The first thing is that you unit propagate the literal. Okay. And uh, optionally, you can learn the deduction that you are performing in form of a clause. But remember that uh, if a conjunction literal entails another literal, you can write this as a clause, right? So if mu prime entails uh, eta, then, you then this can be written as not mu prime or eta as a clause, right? So if mu prime is the subset of mu, which causes the deduction of eta. This is called the theory propagation, the process, okay? So you can add this clause optionally as if, uh, you notice that this clause is a lemma, is a valid. If mu prima entails in the lit, if mu prima entails eta in the theory, this means that this clause is valid. So you can safely add it. So, you, so the point is, is uh, you can safely add it and pretend that you, you had entailed eta on, as a unit propagation on, on this atom, on, on this clause here. Notice that mu prime is a subset of your control assignment. Are we there? Are we get, guys, are we there? So we have a truth assignment. Yeah. 
a theory solver says, okay, look, not only your mu is satisfied, but, but you can also tell this literal, so, uh, which means the truth value of, uh, of, uh, to some of the atoms that uh, uh, are part of the formula. You can entail this as a consequence of mu. Okay? If this is the case, well, actually, what he does is it entails this. So, where mu prime is the subset of mu which actually causes this entailment. Okay? So, if so, you can do these thing, two things. Give back to the sub solver the mu, say, okay, look, you should unipropagate this. Second, you say, look, you can learn this clause either permanently or temporarily. Okay, in practice, typically, since there are, there are many, many such deductions, uh, most uh, SMT solvers do not learn this, um, this clause explicitly, but rather they, they keep it, on, they learn it only on demand. So they, they use it, they add it to the formula only, and they compute it and they add it to the formula only if this is required by conflict analysis. So when you get conflict analysis and you don't have any more, you have no justification, no antecedent liter for eta, then you on demand compute this clause. Notice that both uh, T deduction clauses and T conflict clauses are called the theory lemmas because they are lemmas, they are valid. Let me show you an example here. Again, and here you justify the, the famous T step before, right? So we have this partial assignment and we invoke a theory solver on top of it. Notice that this not, not yet satisfy your formula. So you invoke a theory solver. This is satisfiable. Okay, but they say, hey, look, notice that these two literals here entail the fact that this other literal, which is B3, where is it, is false. So if this, if this guy is false and this guy is false, as a consequence, well, substantially by uh, triangular uh, inequality, then you can infer that not B3 is, so the, the B3 must be false. So if so, you can unipropagate not B3. And learn the deduction clause B5 or B1 or B3. Actually, what typically Solzlover do, they don't learn it explicitly. Rather, they keep it and they add it on demand if required by uh, conflict analysis. So, for instance, this is exactly what was done here, right? So this was not learned explicitly, was not added explicitly, but uh, but we have uh, uh, we use it, we generate it on the fly if needed by conflict analysis. Okay, so this uh, answers the the questions before. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, there are another one which may be useful, another trick which is maybe useful uh, in some situations, which is called pure literal filtering. Okay, remember what a pure literal is. A literal is, uh, well, an atom is pure, uh, of course, only a pure, uh, a positive literal is pure if it occurs only positively. So that atom occurs only negatively. And uh, a negative literal is positive only if it occurs only negatively. Okay? So substantially, if, if an atom occurs only with only a fixed polarity, this is a pure literal. Okay? Remember? Uh, importantly, okay, if you have uh, a non Boolean theory atom, so this, the case of uh, Boolean theory atoms is uh, uh, positive, of uh, pure uh, Boolean theory atom, theory atoms, like Boolean atoms is not uh, relevant. So suppose you have a theory atom which occur only positively in the original formula. Notice here importantly, in the original formula, not without consider learner closed. 
Okay. Okay. So suppose we have this atom, and suppose that during a search, we add the, the um, so the truth assignment assign this literal false. Okay. Or if you prefer, if an atom occurs negatively and during the search you, you assign it to true. Okay. Then what we can do is uh, that the uh, well this may have some role. Uh, well, for instance, the typical situation is when this unipropagated, uh, this negative value is unipropagated on uh, on learner clauses. Okay. Well, when this is the case, then you can drop that negated literal, the negation of that atom, the, of that literal from the list of uh, the set of the theory atoms that you pass the theory solver. Why is this the case? Uh, well, and, uh, and this is perfectly safe. So if, so this has two possible consequences. First of all, you, you pass less literals to the theory solver. So this means that the theory solver has less work to do, right? Uh, but the second situation is that when you are at the end of the branch, uh, you drop uh, literals which may have made this theory, the truth assignment false, and you, uh, you increase the chances of uh, the truth assignment to be consistent. Okay. So the question is, why can you do this? Why can you safely do this? Well, the reason is that if you assign, if you are, if you have a truth assignment, with the same reason of a pure, the pure literal rule to some extent, but it's different. Remember the, the pure literal rule of the DPLL. But um, so when you have uh, um, a negative, a literal occurring negatively in the form, uh, occurring positive in, in the form, and you assign it false. And if the truth assignment satisfies the formula, this means that also the same truth assignment without with toggling the truth value will satisfy the formula, okay? Because of this, the ass assignment that literal to false did not contribute to, uh, to make the formula, uh, to satisfy the Boolean abstraction of the formula, okay? So you can pretend you haven't assigned it. So this means that if, if, a truth, um, a truth assignment, a uh, sat proposition satisfies the original formula, okay, and uh, is uh, um, and it assigns a positive literal to uh, to to false. Then you could you could in principle safely drop that literal from the truth assignment, and this would still satisfy. The original formula. Okay, are we there? Think about that. If the course only positively, and you assign this, if A occurs only positively, and you assign A to false, this means that uh, in every clause where A occurs, there should be some other literal which. Uh, which uh, uh, were uh, satisfied, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have. So if you assign false, something which is true, which is positive, this will be dropped away from the clause, right? So this means that the, there is, should be some other liter in the clause which are satisfied, okay? Okay, so, so this means that you can safely drop. So we can pretend we didn't assign it. So you may wonder, but why was it assigned? Well, you may, there are many reasons. For instance, the decision you decided to decide it, and mo most frequently, this was unipropagated on uh, learned clauses. Remember that if an atom occurs only positively, will typically occur with early prune, with the pure literal filtering. It will occur only negatively. In, a, in the learner clause. So we will be, be very often unipropagated on that. Okay, so you can safely drop from it. So one, uh, 
this is useful? Well, for many reasons. First, uh, it uh, decreases uh, the, the increases the chance of having uh, finding a satisfying assignment. It uh, gives less uh, uh, workload to the resolver. And in particular, used when, uh, in case where you have a nasty negative literals. For instance, negative equalities in the integers are very bad to handle, right? Because a negative equality in the integer has to be split into cases. So if term equals zero, so in the, in the integers, if a term different from zero means that you have to split into two cases, term strictly smaller than zero and term strictly greater than zero. Okay, so this involves extra search. So, but if this occurred positively and you have assigned it to, uh, to force just by some silly reason, okay, you, you can avoid adding this and this avoids you this nasty um, step. Well, one drawback is that it may weaken the effect of early pruning. So it's not always the case that uh, pure literal filtering is a good idea to apply. Uh, okay, so for instance, consider this case. You have this, uh, suppose you have, you have this uh, three, seven, seven um, clauses, and you, you have learned this one uh, by, by learning in, during the search. If you have this truth as partial truth assignment in blue, okay, then you can ignore, so you have this partial assignment which is um, assigned to, to true the, the atom 3 v1 minus v3 is more equal than 6, which occurred negatively here. Okay, notice that this can be possible, so this formula satisfies. The formula only because there, of course, another literal which was assigned in, in the same clause. Otherwise, it was not it was not possible that we satisfy. And why was it assigned? Well, typically, it was assigned due to, for instance, uh, unit propagation or decision on top of uh, the clauses. Okay. Now you can drop this from the, the formula, okay? You can drop this from the, sorry, from the truth assignment. You see, this is in gray. You can avoid passing this atom to the truth assignment. And this is perfectly safe. Why? Because this is, this, the assigning this to the formula did not Assigning this to true did not contri actually contributed to uh, the uh, satisfaction of the Boolean abstraction of the formula. Okay, so the same truth assignment without assigning this truth assignment would would uh, satisfy the, the Boolean structure anyway. Okay, so you pretend that you haven't done it. Okay. Okay, notice that when you do early pro, uh, pure literal filtering, you should not consider learning uh, learn clauses. Learn clauses are just uh, something which are consequence of the original formula, okay? So they are just uh, something which are entailed by the original formula. So they, they don't contribute to the logic to reduce or enlarge the, the number of models of the formula, okay? Which means they should not be considered so this also means that you should uh, evaluate the polarity of every atom before learning. Okay, so the, the evaluation of the polarity of the atom should be done before learning. Okay, because if you do this after learning, many, many, um, many liter which are pure will not appear as pure. So for instance, here, uh, you should evaluate the polarity, if you evaluate the polarity after learning this clause, then uh, this liter would not appear to be pure anymore, right? Because this occurs both positive, negatively here and positively here. Okay. Okay. 
Another important fact that you should be aware of uh, in SMT, but also in other application, which it will prevent one possible source of inefficiency. So semantically equivalently, but syntactically different atoms in general are not recognized to be the same atom and may be back to different Boolean atoms in the Boolean structure. Okay in general, or one definition of the other. And this would cause inconsistency, right? Because if you say, if you have two different atoms, like uh, X minus Y is more equal than zero, and uh, X is more equal than Y, they are exactly the same, semantically identically atom, but they're syntactically different. If you don't recognize them to be the same atom, then you could call the first B1 and the second B2. Okay, and it may be the case that during the search, B1 is assigned to true and B2 is assigned to false, or vice versa, which is intrinsically inconsistent because they are the same atom. Okay, or one the negation of the other. If you have uh, x, uh, if you have x is more equal than uh, y, and uh, uh, y is uh, and x uh, great, strictly greater than y, one is the negation of the other, but you should be able to recognize that. Otherwise, you may assign one to true and the other both to true and without realizing that. Okay. So the solution is a proposal is trying to is to identify as, as much as possible trivial equivalent atoms or trivial equivalent literals and map them and rewrite them into the same atom or the same literal. So that the Boolean structure maps them into the same atoms. And the, so no such silly inconsistent assignment will be generated. So for instance, one important thing is sorting. If you have uh, an expression like this, uh, you may, these three atoms are all uh, equivalent, but they are just a uh, permutation of one to the other. Let's rewrite them the same, all the same way, V1 plus V2 minus V3. So take, so get a normal form uh, to, to represent uh, the same atoms of the same kind. So that, all those three atoms will be rewritten all, the, in the, all as this, and so they will be always labeled with the same Boolean atom. Uh, you always remove Boolean operators. So keep only, so if you have one smaller than V2, or V1 greater or equal than V2, just rewrite them as not V1 smaller than V2 and not V1 smaller than V2. So these are recognized to be one the negation of the other. Uh, you exploit associativity. So these two atoms are syntactically different, but they are semantically the same, right? So drop, exploit the associativity. Uh, try, and then uh, you should exploit some of the properties of the theory, okay? So for instance, uh, uh, you can factor out the number. So these two atoms here are the same, are semantically identical, but they look different. So let's rewrite all of them, for instance, assuming that setting the, um, the constant term uh, as one. So both can be rewritten as 0 0.251 plus 0 0.52, okay? So rewrite atoms in a normal form, whatever normal means, okay? You invent a form in a normal form and then you uh, st uh, state, um, verify that. Also, you can exploit properties of uh, theta. For, for instance, in, uh, in linear integer arithmetic, you can use only one between the smaller equal and the smaller, right? Because uh, one smaller or equal than, than uh, a constant is the same as one strictly smaller than a constant plus one. So they can both be written as one smaller or equal than a constant, for instance. So you see there are many ways by which you can normalize atoms. You have introduced some canonical form to represent atoms, and, the, and then uh, you have uh, to uh, stay on that, uh, check, um, comply with that. Okay, so this prevents a lot of very of the, the creation of silly inequality, uh, silly inconsistencies, in search, and it reduces also the much of the number of atoms in uh, uh, in the. Um, the number of variables in the, the Boolean structure of the formula, which is, this reduces search 
avoids a silly inconsistency and so on and so forth. So this is simple but very important. Uh, well, this is something that sometimes you use, but for instance, uh, we don't use it anymore in maths. Um, it's a static learning. Uh, a static learning is uh, detect a priori if there are some obvious uh, simple uh, uh, clauses which can lemmas which can be learned a priori due to the semantics of the, the, uh, of the atoms. So for instance, uh, if you have a term equal constant with the same term, uh, you can always uh, state that these are mutually exclusive, right? So if you have uh, the same term on the left and equal as uh, some constant, and you have uh, different terms with different constants, then you can always infer that one, uh, that they are mutually exclusive, right? Also, you can always uh, detect incongruence uh, uh, lemmas. So for instance, if you have this situation, then you can automatically encode uh, the uh, add a clause saying that there are, uh, that the congruence must hold. Uh, this also process is also is well known in logic and is called Ackermanization by Ackerman. It's a process introduced by Ackerman and this is you frequently use. Uh, you can uh, add the constraints uh, due to the um, reveal uh, partials and due to uh, transitivity, right? So if uh, x minus y is equal to two and y minus z is more equal than four, then uh, this is then x uh, x minus z is more uh, of four must be true. So if this is negated, this cannot. So this is a conflict set. Okay. So you may ob by obvious properties of the of the uh, arithmetic if you are dealing with arithmetic of congruence if you are doing with UF and so on. You can sometimes generate a, realize a priori very quickly that there are some obvious lemmas. Okay. Well, typically we have a band of this because typically they tended to generate a huge amount of lemma, most of which were completely useless, and which would have been found by the SMT solver anyway in a cheap way. This is something that you should uh, think seriously instead when you're doing codings. So sometimes if you are encoding a problem into SMT, and there are some obvious properties which can be inferred like this, it may be worth adding them just uh, to, uh, if there are not too many, just to tell the sub solver that you can, in, every time uh, you have x equals zero, then you can immediately you can propagate that uh, uh, x equal one is false. So without losing your time. Uh, okay, there are other optimization techniques. Uh, uh, which I can uh, save you uh, and I, I leave you to the, if you are interested in uh, writing efficiently an SMT solver, uh, then uh, you should read uh, this, my, either my very long um, survey on SMT or uh, the, our chapter on uh, the handbook of satisfiability on, on SMT. Okay, guys, I think, uh, uh, oh, just le let me just, uh, uh, conclude a little well no we are over so guys uh, see you if you don't have any more question i think that i see you tomorrow okay okay thank you thank bye. you very much bye guys bye. Bye. thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.